I'd like to call the um, pupil services meeting for order. Um, Ryan, I turn it over to you. Good evening. Uh, no registered public commenters for the pupil services committee. Um, with that, could I get approval for the January 9th minutes? I so Four, zero. And this is Kleiman. Would you like to give us an update on the Peacemaker Center? Yes, I'm actually going to request that we remove the approval of the Peacemaker Center contract. At this time, we're still in negotiations with them uh, in the terms of the agreement. So hopefully, I'll be able to bring it back next month when we come to some agreement. Okay, thank you. <coughs> and now we will have a review um, of the Chapter 339 K-12 Comprehensive Counseling Plan by Dr. Warner. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. I appreciate uh, your time and the opportunity to go over the district's 339 plan and really highlight uh, the outstanding job that our school counselors are doing from K to 12. Uh, this 339 plan, really the most difficult piece of all of this, was, was to limit it uh, down to, a, to a, uh, an attainable document uh, because our counselors, as you know, uh, are doing an outstanding job day in and day out um, for, for all of our students, uh, K to 12. So, but this is really going to be uh, capturing what their programming, uh, what their daily day looks like, if we can describe that in some way. Uh, but just recognize this is just a brief snapshot uh, and, and meeting the needs of a 339 plan for our district. Uh, so just to review what a 339 plan is, the K-12 Comprehensive Counseling Plan, it's a requirement for all school districts uh, to have a 339 plan on their files. Uh, and it comes up uh, through the, the timeline, that it's something that the district needs to complete after the, the comp plan. So we went through a lot of work to do a wonderful comprehensive plan for our district last year. Uh, and then this 339 counseling plan dovetails nicely uh, and it allows us as a counseling department uh, to look at the needs for the district and, and make sure that we're aligned with, with the district needs and, and the vision and mission for, for all of our students. Uh, we originally constructed uh, this 339 plan back in 2018. It was looked at as an exemplar from uh, PDE and was actually up on uh, their school district uh, as an example for others to follow. So we're, we're hopeful that this current uh, draft plan for tonight for your review and approval uh, is looked at with, uh, with, with such appreciation and good graces from PDE when uh, we're able to submit. Uh, and again, I've touched on this, but really the 339 plan in PDE's words is the connection between the school counseling that we do, uh, college, and career education and planning. So I hope you find this uh, helpful and, and, and uh, illuminating for, for what our counselors do each and every day. Uh, so I'll go over just the basics of the 339 plan, the components, then what that looks like specifically uh, with, with, with our counselors, what that delivery looks like, uh, and then also highlight a couple of uh, future events that align to our 339 plan and, and welcome you to attend any of those upcoming uh, so the first piece of the 339 plan goes over the different school counselors, their roles, and their assignments. We've had a pretty decent uh, turnover over the past couple of years since 2018. There's a lot of new uh, and updated faces. About 20 to 25 percent of our staff, uh, our counselors have have, um, have, uh, have changed since uh, revision. Uh, so this is a great opportunity for us to make sure that we are um, fully aligned uh, as, as a department to make sure even our elementary counselors know what our middle and high school are doing and, and vice versa. Um, so again, we're looking at our mission, our vision, our goals uh, for the district and making sure that we are uh, consistent with what uh, the, the counselors are doing uh, and making sure that they're hitting on all of those different areas, including access and equity. Uh, you'll see a couple of different pieces that touch on that, but those are really the mindsets that, that we're bringing to, to everything that we do to make sure that we have um, the, those areas at the forefront of our mind where we're delivering a lot of these different uh, interventions and supports for students. Uh, the first big chunk, uh, sorry, so we did connect with a lot of stakeholders uh, in our formal advisory council uh, made up of uh, parents, community uh, members, business leaders, uh, and actually even students and teachers uh, that, that informed and updated this 339 plan uh, that you see in, in, your, in your packet. Uh, the first piece uh, component of the uh, 339 plan itself is the program calendar that really just looks at you know month to month what are the different tasks that a counselor is asked to do. 
Uh, it's broken up by elementary, middle, and high, and then K to 12. I know that's a little confusing, but the different areas are, are uh, area specific, and K to 12 is looking at what's consistent throughout all of our buildings. Uh, the different domains that are hit are academic, career, and social, emotional. Different tasks uh, fall into those uh, buckets. So what does this look like on a typical day? Well, at the elementary school level, uh, you'll see our counselors involved in individual and small group counseling. We're doing a lot of behavior management. PBIS is our positive behavior intervention support. We have that wonderful program in 10 out of our 11 elementary schools. Uh, and our counselors are really uh, the boots on the ground for those kind of uh, uh, initiatives and, and, and programs able to recognize the, uh, the, the positive and the pro-social behaviors that our students are doing uh, and rewarding our students and, and recognizing those uh, behaviors that we want to see. Uh, the VRS, the Violent Risk Screener, and the Violent Risk Assessment, we've talked about that as a committee before, but they're, they're very much uh, integral in uh, when a student needs that, that assessment. They're, they're kind of running point, so to speak, uh, in any of that. Same as a uh, Suicide Risk Screener and Suicide Risk Assessment. Uh, they're also critical team members uh, for new student uh, orientation or enrollment. Obviously, for our, for our kindergartners, that, that first, uh, those first couple of days, really making sure that they feel welcome uh, and part of the community but also any student that may come mid-year, that counselor is really uh, the, the point person to make sure that they have a smooth transition into Westchester. Uh, they're a big uh, team player on our equity teams uh, in our gifted screening process. Uh, they start some of the career exploration artifacts, and even in kindergarten, we're exposing some of the careers out there, but that really takes uh, an uptick in uh, third, fourth, and fifth grade. Uh, there are 504 plan coordinators for the district, so any students that are on their caseload for 504 they're managing uh, those annual 504 meetings and, and updates. We're also key members on the MTSS team. We've talked about that before. That's our multi-tiered system of support made up of different counselors, psychologists, reading specialists, intervention specialists that are looking at the supports that our students might need, whether it's academic, behavior, speech, social, uh, and emotional. So they're, they're uh, key, uh, uh, not only people that, that are there as a team member, but they're also delivering also uh, our, our resources for our second step program uh, and that really uh, is, is looking at the soft skills uh, in, in, in students but if anyone has worked with anyone that doesn't have those soft skills they're anything but soft uh, so we're looking more at life skills and just reframing that for success skills that we want our students to uh, to, to, to have uh, and we'll talk more about that later on uh, this school year because it's, it's a big issue for next school year and we'll uh, hopefully have more time to spend on second step as, as we uh, next is program delivery. This is really just looking at those tasks I was explaining for all the different levels and putting them in, in different buckets, different areas, four areas to really look at uh, the different percentages of, of time that the state wants to see kind of where people spend the most uh, amount of time. Um, look at our elementary students who are spending most of their time in doing student support. Uh, our middle school students, which are our middle school counselors, which we'll show on the next slide, they were doing more individual prevention and intervention. Uh, and then um, our high school students are doing, or sorry, high school counselors are working more with individual students, looking at different career and college readiness and doing more transcript evaluations, uh, doing more individual supports compared to their um, uh, kindergarten, uh, K-5, to and, and middle school counterparts. All right, specific delivery uh, at the middle school. You'll see a lot of the same things here as you saw in elementary. The first part that you'll see kind of anything new uh, is that red ribbon week. So that's our drug-free prevention. It's a, it's a fantastic program that's really well-received and well-adopted across all of our three middle schools. And our counselors <coughs> again play uh, an inter integral role in, in making that a success for all of our students. Uh, they also help uh, specifically at the middle school level with course selection, and uh, they, they ensure a smooth transition from elementary to middle school, but also, uh, importantly, from middle school to high school, that, that transition to make sure students are set up successfully uh, again, with, the, with an equity and access mindset, as I talked about earlier. Uh, any questions before we get into anything else? I mean, I've, been, I've, I've talked a lot and gone over the 339, but any questions uh, at this point? All right, great. Uh, the last piece, uh, the last critical piece uh, that takes up the bulk of the, of the formal 339 plan is the curriculum action plan. That's kind of getting into more of the career uh, artifacts and the career education work and, and, and the ASCA domains for, for careers. So 
that's going to look a little different uh, at all three levels, but it, it really sees an uptick at the high school level. So that's where we're going to focus uh, next. Uh, again, we're looking at pretty much the same seven or eight first bullet points. We added QPR and that behavior management. That's something specifically our counselors are involved in. That's QPRs, our question, persuade, and refer, our suicide prevention program. We have that for all of ninth graders. Our counselors uh, are, are, again, a, a pretty integral part in making sure that that is a success. We also do that uh, for all of our new teachers that we hire in, in August to make sure that everyone has those skills and uh, knows how to respond in, in a certain situation to get our students the support that they need. Uh, next, they're doing a uh, classroom presentation. This is just looking at uh, really just sharing the different opportunities that we have in, in, in this wonderful county that we're in, like TCHS. Uh, or some of the um, uh, different fairs that we have, the different internship opportunities, uh, and then looking at course selection, make sure our students are challenged, and make sure that they know all the different courses uh, that, that are afforded them, make sure that they're on track to graduate. Uh, and last, certainly not least, is the college application process, looking at the letters of recommendation, uh, and financial aid, and everything else that goes into that. All right, and then the 339 really rounds out with uh, just uh, looking at the post-secondary resources that we have for our uh, district, our, our students, not only our students, but, but staff as well. And then we talk more about the, uh, it follows through a, an individualized academic career plan, a sample student, um, just kind of looking at that progression in K-12, the different artifacts, the different experiences that our students uh, are going through uh, under that, that uh, counseling umbrella and, and career umbrella. Uh, then looking at the career and technical strategies, again, the different resources that we have, Job descriptions are listed for all the people that I've talked about here, uh, and then a sample student career artifacts. So closing this out, you remember the last time I was here, I was talking about the ASVAB with our outstanding uh, career counselors. Uh, we've had a wonderful success this year. Uh, that we really appreciate your support uh, in, in getting that off the, off the ground. Again, we had about 25 to 30 students at uh, Henderson, about the same at Ruston, and we're hoping to uh, eclipse that mark at, at East the more that people uh, hear about it. So again, thank you for that and, and giving more and more students that opportunity. Uh, again, it's about opportunity and experience. We've done a lot of job shadowing, guest speakers, lunch check-ins. Um, really, we have two outstanding uh, newer career counselors, and, and they are hitting the ground running. They're, they're doing a phenomenal uh, job. So uh, they've done a lot of field trips, and I really welcome you. Uh, for my last slide is really just the upcoming events that we have. You're certainly welcome to, to, to join us, hop on uh, the, the bus for any of those uh, field trips, the learn to earn experience that we have coming up. Career days are a wonderful way to get in the building and see uh, not only what we have in, in the building, but get to see some students and, and their uh, work of uh, you know, just seeing what, what, what's going to be a good fit for them. Prevention, intervention, and responsive services, individual student planning, and then system support, right? So this is sort of like how the, the teams allocate their time. So I'm, I'm curious if you can give me some background on why at the K through five up level, that third one around individual student planning is the lowest percentage in comparison to six through eight and nine through 12. And I, I have to say I'm a little bit surprised by that because I would think the elementary years would be where we would have a heavier lift in terms of identifying student need. So the work around 504s and IEPs, I almost expect an inverse. So I'm kind of curious, especially since we often um, develop the students and, and start to move the students off the supports as they get to the higher grades. Um, if you could maybe share a little bit about that inverse because it definitely has more increased allocation at the higher levels. Sure, and, and I would agree. I think you're, you're spot on with the IEPs and the 504s being more uh, prevalent, at least at the onset at, at elementary. Uh, but if you think of the different uh, college and career and the artifacts and the different individual counseling that a student might, might need, I think that's where you see the uptick in middle school and especially high school where a lot of their roles, because this, this, I've been saying counselors, but this also includes our career counselors too. We pretty much spend all day one-on-one -on -one or very small groups. I think that's why you see that slight um, uh, increase for, for their role. Thank you. 
Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, I just want to highlight one thing with our average, I skipped over this, but on uh, our, our school counselors and assignments, I said we had a lot of turnover, but I, I, I want to pause at our um, student to, to counselor ratio. Um, so the, the, the ASCA uh, will, will recommend 250 to 1, uh, and then the national average is actually around 408 uh, to, to 1. So I'm happy to report that when you consider our, uh, our, our school counselors, uh, along with our mental health professionals. So if you recall, we had uh, about three mental health specialists from, from the IU two years ago, and now we're up to about 13. So when you include our mental health specialists that are also addressing our student needs with our counselors, we're at a ratio uh, that's fantastic in my mind, 225 to one below that ASCA level. I just wanted to add that as a parent of a high school senior and an eighth grader, I have sent more than my fair share of emails to counselors in the past few weeks, and I really appreciate exactly what you were saying about how important they are in helping to select appropriate classes and to do college planning, and even once a student is in a class, making sure that they continue to have the right support and that everything is on a path that everyone has, feels comfortable with. So oh, I just want to say how much I appreciate the responsiveness of our counselors and how much work they do for our kids. Thank you. I, I appreciate that feedback. I'm, I'm Dr. Werner and Ms. Kleiman. Bill, social, emotional, we have the equity team under that particular category, but we um, talked about being contextualized through academics and career planning as well, correct? And I know you met with uh, Dr. Martin. I did, yeah. That. We talked about um, how equity really comes in to a lot of the pieces about the opportunity and looking at not only new student, new student orientation for new kindergartners, but also students coming in mid-year to make sure that they feel that they're home, um, but also a student maybe transitioning from Stetson to Ruston to make sure that they feel uh, that, that that school is a place for them, that they feel grounded in and uh, appreciated as, as a learner. Mm -hmm. Very good. Thank you. And thank you, uh, thank you both. Are they, we have to vote on this, correct? Correct. Yep. So, um, yes? Yes. Yes. And thank you. Four to zero. Thank you. Thank you. I believe that's it for, um, I think Simon, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that's it for pupil service yeah, that's it. this evening. Thank you so much for everybody and who's attending, the audience, and uh, the people who participated. Thank you. Thank you.
start um, our education committee meeting. Um, we start off with public comment. Thank you. There are 11 registered commenters this evening for the education committee. Uh, just as a reminder, persons wishing to make public comment on agenda items only were required to properly register prior to the 7 p.m. designated start time of tonight's meeting. When public commenters' names are called, I ask that they please approach the podium, begin by stating their first name, last name, and municipality. Public comments are limited to three minutes per person. The three-minute time clock will be projected on the screens located throughout the room. The board asks that all commentary be directed to the board as a whole. Public comments may be interrupted or terminated if the commentary exceeds three minutes or if it is obscene and or threatening in nature. All persons attending this meeting are expected to conduct themselves with decorum and civility. In addition to refraining from abusive and profane remarks, please also be respectful of all persons and public comments, including those comments and opinions that differ from your own. Distracting and disruptive behavior or other actions which interfere with the orderly conduct of tonight's public meeting will not be tolerated. I'm going to call the names of those who registered in order. The first being Celine Lakeo. Good evening and thank you for having us and for opening this forum. My name is Elena Lacayo. I am from the West Ocean Municipality. I'm a parent in the district. I have two children in um, middle school, one in elementary. I'm also an interpreter for the district. Um, many of my comments were addressed in an email. I wanted to open the conversation rather than just having the board making a decision on behalf of us. The district always says that they want to have a partnership with us. So I urge you to actually honor that by having a task force of diverse um, backgrounds. I don't see any immigrants in this board. I don't see any Hispanics in this board. And also, I don't know your backgrounds. I don't know if you have children in different levels. And that would be very important to me. But as I was talking to my children, they also felt that they would like to have a say that even their classmates would like to have a say. And this includes my third grader, who strongly wants to achieve higher levels and feels that she was gonna have that opportunity, like her siblings, by having level uh, classes. Now, I did read your uh, minutes, so I read all of the abstracts that were presented there, and I feel that, yes, they have a lot of good information. However, they all present positive views of the unleveling. I would like to see also the opposite side of the coin because how can we make a decision that is informed if we're always saying, oh, this is great. Another issue that I have with this is that I don't know that we're taking into account our English language learners. I don't know if you have been in the shoes of someone who comes new to the US classroom and um, then is expected to be learning like the rest of the, the children in that class. Now there's opportunities in the leveling where, yes, they get pulled out, and yes, there's a different level, so when they achieve a certain degree, they can move on. I don't know how this would look like if we don't have these differences. Another thing that I see is, um, one of the research specifically was very narrow-minded and it focused on race, uh, labeling Latinos and blacks as the, need, the ones that needed to have uh, the help. I think that rather than race, we should focus on academics, and yeah, maybe economics could play a choice, but I don't think that race should be the one and only. We're in 2023, it should be much more open and diverse than that. I see that I only have 30 more seconds, so I would say also um, that maybe uh, the, the process, yes, would allow everybody to be maybe at a better level, including the ones that are lower, but how would they be uh, socially and emotionally, even. academically, maybe, yes, we can raise everybody, but what are we going to do with those kids who are bored in the class already in elementary school? What are we going to do with those who are already intimidated by their classmates who are ahead? My time is up, so thank you. Lauren Bryant. Children in 
the Westchester Area School District at Greystone Elementary School. Let me start by saying that I truly believe that every student should be given the opportunity to learn and achieve in order to reach their potential. To address the concerns that lower achieving students are not given opportunities to learn at higher levels, you must consider why are they presently below level. In terms of reading and language arts specifically, what does your data reveal? We need to look at the reason we have students that are behind. Why can't they read on grade level? Have they truly been taught the fundamental skills needed to be successful readers and writers? You can group them all you want, but if we don't address the issue here, we are not going to see meaningful change. What have we done as a district in the past, and what are our plans in the future to implement structured literacy when teaching reading in order to meet the needs of all students? You have stated that this new model would provide an equal op learning opportunity for all students. This would require teachers that are able to plan and deliver instruction for higher achieving students as well as those that are below grade level. This leaves me with the following questions which I have emailed but have yet to receive a reply to. I have four important questions. Could you please provide me with the studies and research that have been done that proves that this is best for all learners, those that struggle, also those that are high achieving. Could you also please provide me with the training that your middle school teachers have had in order to effectively teach and manage heterogeneous groups since they will now be required to teach at multiple levels. Could you please describe what this will look like in the classroom? How will those teachers be able to meet the needs of high-level learners, challenging those children while simultaneously meeting the needs of struggling learners as well? What additional supports will be provided? Also, a good instructional practice which has been used by this district in the past is to pilot new initiatives. What, have, what is our plan for the pilot program and how will you measure and communicate the success and challenges brought by this change? My greatest concern is that this was a quick decision without a deeper look into the data regarding student achievement and instruction in K-5, and that this will result in chaos and unintended negative impacts on both underachieving and higher achieving students, as well as increasing frustration for teachers. The district has not asked parents for feedback or input on this matter. This decision was made very quickly and teachers have not been given adequate training in order to make this effective. I am asking that the board, the board vote no for this change and re recommending that a task force be comprised of parents and educational staff to further investigate why students are below level and how we can best meet the needs of all learners in our district. Thank you very much for listening. Caitlin Jensen. My name is Caitlin Jensen, um, and I live in West Goshen Township. Um, I have two children. They attend East Bradford Elementary School, um, and I'm here to speak about my concerns um, in regards to the changing of the sixth grade leveling. Um, my son currently has a GIEP, um, and I'm curious about how adjustments will be made for students with a GIEP. I'm concerned about this upcoming possible change and how it will affect students and teachers, as it will increase the range of learners in the classroom, and the class sizes are already very large. Um, what professional development will the teachers be given to ensure that they are fully prepared for this huge change? And also, is the heterogeneous grouping for reading on a trial basis? Um, if it is, what time frame and metrics will be used to track its success? As a concerned parent who will always advocate for their children, I'm asking that the board vote no for this possible change in curriculum. Thank you for your time. Amy Nelson. Hi, my name is Amy Nelson. I'm a, a resident of East Goshen, and I have two children, uh, two daughters, one in seventh grade and one in fifth grade. Thank you for allowing me to address you. And I'd like to thank uh, the parents that went before me because I um, agree with their questions and with the things that they've said. Uh, I think that um, personally, I have many more questions than I have information. I've tried to look at meeting notes um, before tonight. I've tried to look on the district um, and trying to piece together what this puzzle is. I feel that there are just from what I've been able to see, that there is a history of um, this work um, and research to the, the work of whether the district should be 
in leveled classes for sixth grade or in um, uh, heterogeneous classrooms. But as a parent, I do not know what that history is. And I think it's important for us to know where are we now, what is our current situation, where, how have we gotten to this point, what have changes have been made over the last 10 years um, to, for leveling um, or heterogeneous, or, and what other changes have been made. Um, and then where are we going and what is our plan for, for getting there. Um, I think it's very important for us to know what issue or issues are we trying to improve by going to heterogeneous classrooms and how do we measure how we're doing now with how we're and how are we going to measure when we make a change. Um, I think that that's really, when I think of all the questions that I have, the, those are the questions that I pr prioritize. Um, and then lastly, I just like to request that because there is probably a long history getting to this point, and there's a lot of information including outside research and uh, other schools that have implemented heterogeneous classrooms, um, and then also there's going to be a plan for moving forward that all of this information be um, available to parents in a easy and accessible way and that any questions that parents have um, that they can be shared with other parents so that we're on the same and that the answer is shared so that we're on the same page um, and that's it thank you Langley Barnes. Hi, I'm Langley Barnes. I live in West Georgian Township. I have a third grader at East Bradford, and I um, want to thank all the parents who spoke before me because I very much agree with everything they said. Um, I'm a little on the flip side. I have a son who has a very major IEP. He's really, really far behind. Um, and my concern with all of this is um, taking a look at how are we addressing the fact that all of these kids are really so far behind coming out of the pandemic. I mean, he's, we've struggled and struggled and struggled with him. And, it, and then what I worry about with the leveling, and I want to see more um, sources for this, I did read through all of the, the sources that you had, but as another mom had said previously, I'd also like to see the sources that don't support this so we can get a really good um, take on, you know, for and against it. Um, I have had to rebuild his confidence over the last two and a half years, and it has been a huge struggle. Um, and I don't want him to get into a classroom where, you know, he feels like he can't speak up because he's not. He knows he's not at the level of his friends, and that's something that we struggle with constantly. And I have to reassure him and build him up. Um, the other thing I really worry about too is we already have enough behavioral issues. Is if you're putting all these kids together and like the ones that are far behind get bored and the ones that are gifted get bored, what do you end up with as a teacher? You end up with kids bored in class or kids not getting their needs met, needs met. And that is also a very big concern of mine with all of the, with all of the issues that we hear coming out of middle school and you know, even in elementary school. Um, the other question I have is, have we asked all the teachers? Are they ready to make a change like this? I know that we implemented a new math program this year, and I have a lot of my friends who teach in the district and without, and for the most part, they really like it, but it was a very big uphill climb for them. The other thing that came with was a lot more reading and getting that support, and I know, you know, with coming out of the pandemic, we have struggled with addressing all of that. It's from just my son's IEP. It was and he's out for two and a half hours out of the out of the day. So you, you know, if we're not, do we have enough resources in place to make sure everybody is where they need to be? How are we making sure these kids are up to speed and are getting what they need? Um, the other thing I would ask too is, have we talked to other school districts that have implemented this and then have gone back and not and unimplemented? And those are the kind of things I would like to see. I really like you know, a good parent committee on this. I appreciated Dr. Reynolds, your email about wanting to you know, be in the community and reach out to the parents and the teachers. And I think that's something that we really need and deserve. And I think as board members, we all should have this. So I appreciate your time and thank you for listening. Candy Anderson. I reside in Westtown. 
I am a mother and an educator, a former middle school math teacher with my master's plus 60 credits. I have three children in the district, I'm in sixth, fourth, and first. Um, I'm actually missing my son's basketball game um, to be here tonight to speak um, about the concerns that I have on the removal of leveling in sixth grade and my true fear of it moving beyond sixth grade. While I appreciate the district has listened to the community and understand the need to be more communicative and transparent, Dr. Reynolds' email reads that this change is necessary, but why? My hope is that this is not a predetermined path uh, with a slight pause to give acknowledgement or show a sign of respect to the community, um, but more a legitimate halt uh, to properly do the research and be transparent before making such a consequential decision. I speak from experience as an educator and mother. My three children learn at different rates, from a child in accelerated honors to a child that gets a little dally um, for support. All three children live under the same roof, with the same parents, with the same resources available to them. And despite this, my children all learn at different rates. It would be completely unfair to ask my higher level learner to come down to my lower level learner to meet my lower level learner's needs, and vice versa. They learn at different rates, and that is okay. It is okay to learn at different rates but it's not okay to push children down to raise others up. I implore the board to require the district to create two committees with teachers and parents being a part of the committee to, without bias, review and research studies that support both positions. Prior to making the decision for our children, have the committees present their findings, both sides. Survey the teachers, the parents, and even the students let them voice what they feel is best before making such a big change. You employ really smart people in your schools. You have really smart people in your community. In my opinion, it would be foolish not to tap into those resources. So please do not just rubber stamp this push from administration. Please do your due diligence and create the two committees. Seek input from your teachers. Seek input from your community. The only way to truly be transparent is to take a deep dive into real, authentic research on both sides. Thank you. Frank Pasquani. Good evening, I'm Frank Pasquini, uh, East Bradford Township Resident, three children at East Bradford Elementary, first, third, and fifth grade. Uh, two of which are being educated under a GIEP. Uh, we are very concerned as parents about the potential removal of leveling for fifth grade, for, pardon me, for fifth graders going into sixth grade. In a very narrow scope, how will GIEP services be provided for children going from fifth to sixth grade? And more importantly, for children below fifth grade, three or four years from now, how will those differentiated services be provided absent the leveling process? Can you help me understand that this evening? In K-5, they pull. Will you push? Will you pull? Leveling provides an adequate peer group to continue learning at a high rate. And I look forward to learning more. Thank you. Trenna Franklin. Amongst our children, 
Where this has been implemented, it is suggested to reduce class size so the spectrum of all students' needs can be addressed. At, um, aids be added to classrooms to support students as needed. We must make sure not to group students together and generalize their education, letting high ability students be bored and special needs students fail. Will interventions still be available for those students that need it, whether it be below grade or pulled out for gifted or high, high achieving students? Has been dis discussed to have grades grade B still a bit point. Has it been discussed to have current curriculum be just become more challenging? If that's the issue, that grade level aren't challenged enough, what are we doing with the curriculum we currently have? Um, and, ke and keeping the levels. And then do we continue to evaluate each child and move them amongst levels um, throughout the year? Or perhaps we need to look at elementary and see where they're falling behind and what needs to be pushed more in the elementary to get them to be in a better spot moving into middle school. So thank you. Melissa Bennett. Melissa Bennett, West Goshen Township. Uh, I just wanted to say I'm looking forward to Dr. Martin's presentation tonight. Thanks for being here. Um, I'm especially looking forward to some of the like forward-looking actions that she names, like explicitly addressing the systemic issues that are root causes for underrepresentation of students of color in higher level and gifted programming. I think it relates to this conversation about leveling. And I'll confess that I don't have a strong opinion one way or another um, yet, but I'm interested in how leveling impacts the equity mission, which reads to eradicate institutional racism and inequities through social justice, promoting the emotional development of staff and students and embracing diverse perspectives. And so that's our equity mission, and I think the two seem to be related. I'm wondering how will the Director of Equity be included in these conversations about leveling? And how will we continue to be aware of implicit bias in these conversations? And related, uh, sort of, but not specifically, I'm also interested in how will teachers be supported both in respecting their experience and their expertise, as well as um, in the classroom support either push-ins or for training as we work to implement any decision about leveling. I hope we'll keep an equity lens in this conversation. I hope we keep our equity mission before us as we continue to talk about leveling, uh, which is obviously complicated. You all know there are many layers, and I appreciate the work that you're doing. Thank you. Aaron Lockledge. Good evening. My name is Aaron Lockledge. I'm a parent of three students in the Westchester School District. We're from West Goshen. Um, I am not an educator, but I've spent a career in educational publishing and the development of educational technology. I spend all day, every day, talking with people at the district and state and national level about literacy, about curricula, and about instructional design. So I feel like I can look at this through their lens to some degree, as well as through the lens of a parent. Thank you for your responsiveness in opening up this process and making it more inclusive. Leveling or tracking has been around for 30 years. For 30 years, it has been problematic and fraught with controversy. You can find research on both sides of the fence for or against it. I will say I was largely disappointed with the research that was presented. I did find it one-sided. I felt it was, in many cases, irrelevant. There were several US studies. There was a meta-analysis of international programs. There was a study of students in Hong Kong there was an analysis of data from 18 to 26 nations. There was another 20 nation study. 
There was a, yet another international meta-analysis. There was a study of students in Bavaria. And there was a study of students in other German federal states. And I will admit I had to look up what German federal states were, but apparently Bavaria is just one of them. So I think we can find research that's going to support whatever our position is. The research I would really like to see would look at leveling or look at tracking and compare its efficacy to other measures. I don't think it needs to be leveling or nothing. There are lots of other educational supports that we can put in place to bolster our most challenged learners. I really do not believe this is the best we can do for our children. Tracking in many ways takes our highest achieving students, the students who are middle of the road, and it takes a do no harm approach. It sometimes can bring our lowest achieving students up slightly. I have to believe there are better ways to raise those students up other than just lowering the bar. I'd like to engage in conversations with districts, not just that have included <coughs> measures to eliminate tracking, but districts that have not included those measures and why. Why did they look at tracking or leveling? Why did they decide not to do it? I think those conversations are just as important. I think it's incredibly, incredibly crucial that we make sure we are serving our struggling learners but I do not think this is the way to do so. Thank you. And Karen Seaman.
engaging the community on this topic. So we'll talk about that a little bit more later, but the first thing we need to do is to approve the January 9th Education Committee meeting minutes. Should I get a table? Yep, for nothing, thank you. Um, the next thing on our agenda is that Dr. Wagner is going to be speaking about eSports.
you know, I, I think I think you have a diverse group of kids that really want to be involved in the school, that want to represent the school, right? This was this shirt was made by one of my students, you know. Involved and not all of it is just a person sitting in front of a television or a monitor, you know, one on one with the game. Um, so if you guys want to talk about anything that's on the screen here while we're here, yeah. You mentioned the statistics for female gamers. I am not one of them. Um, I am a teacher at Henderson High School. I've been teaching at Henderson for 20 years. These are two of my students that I actually taught through the pandemic and through the hybrid and the remote learning. And very quickly, especially with Chris, I noticed how in tune he was with technology as I was watching him sitting um, with a animated Star Wars background that cracked me up every day. And it was really just a block out his brother that was sitting behind him. Um, and I constantly asked, how'd you do that? Where'd you find it? And to him, it just, it just came. The technology was just there. Um, for this type of program, the students actually didn't approach me about it. My son goes to Coatesville High School, and Coatesville has a huge esports uh, team. And we're sitting at the homecoming game, and every student walking across the field being introduced was listing all their clubs. And every one of them had esports, esports president, esports captain, esports gamer. And so I started researching myself, and I discovered that the CCIU had the PSEL as an opportunity. And I thought, if I'm going to branch my way into the school with a program that deals with video games, why not go through the CCIU, which is already, a, obviously, a well-established um, avenue to go. Uh, I met up uh, through a couple Zoom meetings, and we decided this year to jump into it. And right away, we put a couple announcements on, and within, I think, about three minutes, Chris was at my door. Where do we go? Where do we start? How can we get this going? Uh, we competed in two different leagues this fall through the PSEL, and both teams uh, did make it to the playoffs in our first season. They are now branching out, looking into some of the other leagues. We're also looking at the PIEA, and the students have gone out on their own to discover some of their own uh, leagues and games. One of the nice things about the club is it does hit students that are not involved in other activities. When I surveyed these two, Chris told me he is not involved in anything else currently at Henderson High School, and Jason is in the board game club, yeah. which is very proud of. Um, it's a very nice opportunity to hit a group of students. It is extremely diverse. I have students that I have in my AP classes. We have uh, students that also are in tech ed programs. We have students in all levels, all grades. I have soccer players. Uh, and any type of student can embrace this. And the one nice thing about the programming is it's not just sitting in front of a game. It is the communication. I brought up a teenager through the pandemic and he was lost without his friends. We were quarantined, we were in our house, there was very few children on our street. And for him to be able to connect with other kids through gaming, his best friend lives in North Carolina, they play through games, they talk through games, they connect and they keep that relationship. So as the district moves forward with social emotional learning, understanding that social emotional learning in certain areas can be met for these types of students through the gaming. Um, the last comment before I allow the students to speak is that I do see gaps in STEM curriculum at, in the high school level. While science and math are really heavily invested in, technology is not necessarily there. Um, through many different programmings, coding and video game design, the amount of careers and college education programs that are out there are huge for, for this type of avenue. And if we don't have access to it in the school system, we're leaving a gap for our students. So the students I brought with me today are Chris Sims and Jason Andrews, and they do have a few comments for you as well. Good evening, everybody. So as stated earlier, I'm Chris, this is Jason, for the uh, co-presidents of the eSports team, uh, as the captain of our League of Legends team that made it to uh, playoffs. Um, we appreciate the time that you're taking to uh, listen to some students here, um, and the consideration that you are taking to uh, implement eSports in the school. Um, we really don't have anything uh, opening to add uh, that hasn't already been stated, um, but we're open to any questions that anybody might have. Yeah, any questions you guys have, we want to fill in the gaps for you guys and just make sure that everybody's familiar with the program and gets like a good understanding. Yeah. P S E L. I, I'm going to be completely honest, I don't actually know what any of the acronyms stand for. <laughs> um, other than that they're, they're like, the, the league names, 
Um, but apart from so that, that, the PSEL is basically an organization. It's like kind of like the top level. And then below that is where the games come in and the individual tournaments that are run. So it's kind of like um, any other like system that's just to put, like the PSEL is just responsible for making sure the people that are gonna get to where they need to be so then they can compete, just like any other system. So you could go to college and major in esports? Um, depending on where you go, you could. Right, um, right, ha you have to pick the place, right. And it, yeah, University of Pittsburgh actually just sent a, a team into the Overwatch League for the first time competing on an international level. That was one good thing. Um, I know that the they actually also sent a team into the ALGS, which is the International Competitive Apex Legends team, which is another video game. Uh, I think they actually placed fifth for a uh, three hundred and fifty thousand dollar prize in that tournament. That was good for them too, which is just three guys that went to a play video games on their computer and made that happen. So. Yeah, and I've uh, I visited some colleges uh, recently, and they, they've invested billions of dollars into their, their teams, and I've gotten numerous scholarships from a couple of these colleges, you know, worth a couple thousand, you know, trying to get me to come to their school and play for esports, so it's definitely a, a prominent thing in college. That's, that's what I wanted to say. Thank you. <laughs> Chris and Jason, we always love it when we have students to come speak with us, and so I'm just going to, I know there's people sitting here who want to ask you questions. I'm just gonna open it up for when I go ahead. So you mentioned League of Legends. Uh-huh. Well, do you play any other games? Um, I, I play a lot of games. Chris also plays a lot of games. Uh, the ones that I'm more invested in now is, um, I play Rust, which really doesn't have an esports scene. It's, it's a lot smaller game. The other one is Apex Legends that I mentioned earlier. That has a bigger scene. But really, uh, there are so many opportunities for pretty much any walk. Um, you probably all know Fortnite or have heard that at some point. That's a massive scene. There's so much money in Fortnite. They say more money has gone through Fortnite than pretty much any other game in the history of gaming. Um, not only that, uh, League of Legends is probably the second biggest. There's uh, Dota. There's, like, even my brother wants to play Super Smash Bros, which is up on the computer right there. You guys can see yeah. Mario, um, which is a one versus one. Yeah. And you don't play on a team, you play by yourself. It's more of like an interpersonal competition. And so there's really uh, room for anyone in pretty much anything. Yeah. And this is more of a comment than a question, but my dad, who went to college in the 1970s, was intrigued by the very earliest video game. Uh -huh. Got a degree in computer science, worked in computer science for his whole career, and now that he's a retired 73-year-old, he spends his time at home playing Halo online. Yeah. <laughs> so this can be a thing after yeah, high yeah. school. So I'm very excited about this. Yeah, yeah there, there's really room for gaming in every, every walk of life for anyone, whether it's something that you're playing on your phone in your free time or it's something that you're sitting down to do in a competitive environment. Like, it, it it's boundless and it's just a way that we can really build a community as a school, I think is one of the biggest things. Yes. Um, I feel like I'm first, actually at first, oh, I'm sorry. I, was gonna, I, was gonna say, I feel like I'm at home. I have an 11 year old losing his mind right now hearing this. Oh, so we yeah. go all the way to Ludwood's Corner to go to Uplink to participate in this kind of stuff. Uh -huh. So to hear something like this be accessible in our community, I mean, if we can find no other silver lining from what we learned from the pandemic is that this is a really untapped resource for so many kids in our community. Um, I think this is amazing what you guys are doing and thank you for raising the awareness not just of us but of the community and what we can offer the students in this space. So. Oh, thank you. Yeah. And I appreciate you all being here. Um, my first introduction to esports was Pong. Um, <laughs> I'm way too young to know what Pong was. Um, but I would like to know, I don't know much about eSports, and that's why I appreciate that you all are here. Can you give me kind of a nickel version of the, the width and breadth of e-games? Like, you mentioned there's some that you can play solo, some that you can play with huge teams. What are some of the different themes for somebody who's a novice like me? Uh, so basically, uh, the way that eSports is right now is basically broken down into, like, I'd say three major categories. You have um, League of Legends, which is a 
You know, you talk about it. Yeah, so, so, <laughs> so League of Legends is a, a very team-related game. So there's, there's five players on each team, and your goal is to essentially capture the other person's base. So very, very simple. Um, and every player picks a character, and each character has their own strengths and weaknesses, so you really have to work together as a team to curate a like, network of strengths and figure out what the weaknesses are and, and get around those weaknesses to take the other person's uh, team. But you know, there's a couple of little little minions that you know fight along with you, and that's that's the sort of like a the team aspect. Of so that. then, the other two that I would say are the biggest in esports right now are games where it's team versus team, <coughs> and the ones where it's multiple teams in one environment. So, Fortnite, Apex Legends, they're known as battle royales, where basically multiple teams are dropped into one world to fight for who's basically going to be the winner of said round. And then the other ones are more tournament driven where maybe one team of five going up against one team of five. That would be Overwatch, uh, CSGO, Rainbow Six Siege, things like that. I know none of those names mean probably <laughs> anything to you. But um, so you can, you can really like, the, I'm trying to figure out a really good way to explain it that doesn't require a lot of terminology for you guys. But basically there's everything from track to an entire football team of 170 people. Like, you, uh, it, you can pretty much go anywhere. There's so many options. I, I can't even figure out how to explain it simply. And the few are very common. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> can I just ask you to yeah. talk yeah. a little bit about um, your, your work with the Unified Athletes? Um, yeah, I think that's important. So I coach the Unified Bocce team at Henderson High School. We're also establishing Unified Track this year. Uh, when I was thinking about the Unified aspect, um, thinking about the life skills students in our school and our students with intellectual and or physical disabilities, esports is an opportunity for them to connect in a way that they can't on the typical playing field. So I approached the Unified Sports Director through the Special Olympics and I connected her with uh, the director of esports at the CCIU, and in a very pretty quick meeting, they discovered that this is a really amazing opportunity, and they're piloting a unified esports league this spring through Rocket League. Rocket League is kind of like a version of soccer placed with played with cars. Um, you hit the ball with the car is the goal. Um, it's a three v three tournament, and it'll be played with one athlete and two partners. So one student will have a intellectual disability and two students will be regular in, and they work as a team together just like they do on the bocce court or the unified track that we'll be having in the spring. So I think it's a nice way to bridge into, and we're thinking about the conversation around equity and hitting you know, not just groups of students that are looking for a gaming aspect, but also groups of students that don't have a lot of opportunities to be competitive in the school environment. I have one other technical question. Um, you know, Obviously, internet safety is something to be a head of concern for for our students. So, how is that um, accounted for in our approach to this program, um, and how are we ensuring the safety of our students? So, currently for the PSEL, we are through the CCIU. CCIU monitors the types of games that are played, so they are not playing a Fortnite type of game. That can be done through a separate league, which they can do outward. Um, but the games are clean and they are safe. Um, through the PSEL, a teacher or a coach must be present during all gaming, so I log in and I am there while they are playing. Um, one of the limitations that we do have currently is that we do not have eSports labs, which is one of the reasons why we are here. Um, not having an eSports lab, I have to run out of the school, I run home, I log into the game, and I have to communicate remotely with the students either through Remind or through email and they're in three to five separate houses depending on the game and I have to try to communicate with all of them. Thankfully, Chris and I have a good remind going back and forth and he has a good connection with the students through other means of communication, but it is a huge limitation, which will also be a limitation for unified athletes if you have a student with an intellectual disability that's at home with a home health aid, home health aid that doesn't understand gaming, they aren't gonna be able to log in and we're gonna be disqualified from that match. So having access to these types of programs in school would also help reduce the risk of anything potentially could happen online, where they would be in one room together with a teacher or supervisor present. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> welcome to my uh, my nightmare when they introduced the uh, concept to me uh, just around 2019. It's how we were going to manage those those logistics because our 
our filter um, and firewall, um, you know, it's configured for a clientele that starts at age five. So um, we've looked at this question, we've, we've talked to some other schools, and um, one of the challenges we have is how do we fund this? Um, my budget can't go toward the support of clubs. It has to be, you know, part of our core curricular program. So what we're looking at perhaps doing is taking some of our older machines, our tower systems out of tech labs and so forth, and then kind of retrofitting them with the graphics cards uh, that would make, that would help uh, our teams be competitive. Uh, we're also looking at um, perhaps um, taking the, uh, the MAC addresses of each of these machines and putting them in a particular place in our, um, in our domain range that we can create some special rules um, you know, that would allow them with adult supervision to access those, those machines at those times and, uh, and play. But it is, it is a, you know, it, there, there are startup costs and there are logistical concerns and uh, we've, been, uh, we've been talking about ways that we can, we can overcome that. We also should say that uh, Ms. Wagner uh, did get a $3,000 grant uh, that she applied for earlier this year. We did um, um, shake down Dell for a few Alienware laptop computers, uh, leveraging our buying power. They, uh, they were able to, uh, to find a few extra Alienware machines they could donate to the school district. Alienware are their high-end laptop computers that are basically built for gaming. So, so we are trying um, our best with the limitations that we have, and we'll continue to talk to other schools and see. Um, you know, we have to find space as well as the, um, you know, the, the logical access out of our network. Any other questions or comments? Last thing, if you don't mind going next, I guess it's yeah. you asked about um, college. Uh, we do have um, just members of the National Association of College Esports, uh, yet another acronym. Um, but you can just see the growing trend. Yeah. Those are, um, again, a part of like, and it's according to NCAAsports.org. Uh, yep. um, so they're as much a part of the NCAA experience as basketball, baseball, other such sports. So it's growing. Um, college career readiness, we want to we support our kids to be doing such a thing. Um, and a lot of universities have really amazing e uh, have labs and they have scholarships. It's a, it's a fun dynamic. So um, I, want, I want to thank these two gentlemen for coming, giving up your time. Thank you. And thank you all for your time. Do you want to ask it? One more question. Oh, please. Yeah, is there a is there a class or is this a community like a gaming community? Sure. So um, there's no there's no class currently. So at Ruston we meet after school uh, to to have like more of like a social club. Uh, all the competitive gaming has to happen at home because we don't don't have the equipment yet um, to to be able to do that in the school. Uh, you know one one way it does intersect with classes is uh, specifically kids that are into like multimedia things. You know a, a big offshoot of gaming is broadcasting um, and as someone who teaches video production you know uh, we've been able to use uh, our equipment to have kids you know after school kind of utilize our mobile broadcasting equipment to you know create little like uh, videos and do play-by-play -play the way you would a sports broadcast uh, you know if you search online, you'll find pretty quickly that these, these events are, if you're unfamiliar, broadcasted in the same way that, that traditional sports are broadcast with, you know, a color commentator and a play-by-play -play person and instant replays and, and all that kind of stuff. So there's no, there's no official uh, way that it's connected to classes, but I think it, it reinforces the skills a lot. So some of those classes would be the connect points for post-secondary ed, to, you know, for entrance into do you make that your major? Like what I, I yeah, I would think of it more like an athletic scholarship than uh -huh. than uh, than a major, right? So like, 
Right, right. But even in college, like you could you could get a you can get an esports scholarship. It, you know, you you may major in communication, but you play for you know the University of Penn State's uh, you know esports team. You know, and you have practices and you have games just in the same way a traditional sport so would. I'm gonna stop to try to take Salisbury. So. <laughs> <laughs> but there are many universities that are creating programming um, and majors that are based around the foundation of esports, uh, coding and video game design. Savannah College of Art and Design has a full video game design program and it is a a profession that is growing very quickly. I, I, I do want to say this is this is like the cultural medium of this generation. In the same way that like my mom used to tell me if I watched too much TV, I'd be a couch potato. <laughs> you know, like like you know, I, I I'm trying to be open. I I have my own kids with the idea that like maybe this isn't like inherently like this is something I should look at as an opportunity for growth and not just like a, something that's inherently like negative. My eighth grader spends his lunches designing video game with his friend, and that they're serious. They're designing this video game. They're gonna do it, and yeah. that's where their heads are. Thank you. We thank you for introducing this to us, and some of us have heard of it, and some of us actually know how to do it. But uh, you mentioned in the sports lab, you mentioned you know what you need to have a program in this school district. You know where it would fit in the curriculum. We don't. So I would suggest, if you're serious, and it sounds as though you might be, um, how about sketching this out? How about taking a look at what it really would take and how much it would cost? How much, you, where would that money come from? You can access that information as fast as I can. So let's find out if this belongs in our schools, in a place in the day, not just a club after school, which limits some other things about programming and, and financing. So let's uh, get your people together and say, what, where is eSports in the Westchester School District? And how does it connect with something like the IU, which has been up and running with this for a, mm, a bit now? So let us know that. When you're ready to come back, you've whetted our appetite now, so come back with, okay, we're serious now. Mm -hmm. I know you are serious, but. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you again. on our agenda, we are going to speak about sixth grade English and reading, and Dr. Reynolds is going to kick off that conversation. Thanks, Dr. Shaw. As Ms. Bailey and, and Dr. Vanilla come forward, I do want to, um, one, thank our parents and our, our family members and community members that are before us in the audience tonight. Thank you for your time. We've heard from a number of you, either through calls or through emails, and so we do appreciate the feedback that we received. I do want to share that I previously put out a communication to our, our, our families to frame our adjusted approach to exploring leveling. And one of the things that we want to make sure that's very clear is that we do have a clear why, but we also want to make sure that it's an inclusive exploration. So moving forward as uh, Ms. Bar uh, Bailey presents, we want to be able to outline moving forward in this work a number of guiding questions as we convene the committee because we recognize that we need to hear from all the stakeholders, our students, we need to hear from our families. We've been hearing from teachers, but we also want to continue to be inclusive in that work, administrators and family members, community members as well. So the four questions that we'll frame for you tonight and continue in our work moving forward are, are this. One, how do we ensure that our structures meet the needs of all learners? And we heard from a number of, of parents as far as students that have uh, students that have GIEPs, students that are right on track, students that may be struggling. We want to make sure that we're framing that for you. We also want to unpack what are academic levels and how are they currently used in our district. That's something that we have to make sure that we're all clear about and that we understand how that impacts our students' learning every day. We also want to outline what does the research tell us about leveling into different classes, particularly at the middle level. And that was something that I know that a number of parents had um, spoke about. And we appreciate you exploring the resources that have been framed. Thank you for the time that you put in, for, for your investment, and what we'll continue to do as we explore 
research, not only what it shares, but also those practices. And the last one, as far as the guiding question, is what are those research-based practices for teaching and reading and writing? What have we done from a professional learning standpoint? What will we continue to do? And what does that look like every day for our learners? So I just want to make sure that you know for tonight, we're not making a decision as far as um, what the path forward is. What we're doing tonight is to share information as far as what that looks like. And with that, I'll turn it over to Mrs. Bailey. Thank you, Dr. Reynolds. <clears throat> Good evening. Thank you to the members of our community who came out tonight to share their perspective. Tonight and over the past few weeks, we've heard many of the concerns regarding sixth grade academic leveling. We want to honor those perspectives, as Dr. Reynolds said, and to work together to continue the conversation. Tonight, I will be sharing with you the why behind the suggestion to remove leveling, the guiding questions that Dr. Reynolds spoke to that will anchor our conversations as we move forward, the research-based practices already in place in our secondary schools, and the next steps that you can expect. Over the course of my presentation, I will be citing a variety of research. Included in the board packet this evening are the references to the research in tonight's presentation. Due to copyright laws, we are unable to print the text in full, but all the research included is available through the Chester County Library System. The Westchester Area School District is an active learning community. Our goal is always to be looking at research at neighboring districts and at nationwide conversations that support us in ways to better improve our practice for our students. Over the past two years, our professional development for our English teachers has centered around specific research-based strategies to improve and support our students during before, during, and after reading. Those professional development conversations have sparked an increase in rigor and deep analysis in our English and reading classrooms. As we continue to engage in this work, the topic of academic leveling continually emerged. In the fall, I was approached by several sixth grade ELA and reading teachers who were interested in having the conversation to remove leveling. These sixth grade teachers are experts in their field, and many come from an elementary background where students are not leveled. The conversation these teachers wanted to explore involved removing, removing leveling in sixth grade English and reading in order to better facilitate the transition from elementary school to middle school. In these conversations, our teachers described in great detail what they noticed day in and day out in the classroom. Our teachers noticed that we limit opportunities for many of our students when we level them in sixth grade English and reading. Our teachers also really spoke to what happens in the classroom. Unlike math, which is broken down into different courses, such as algebra and geometry, when it comes to English, our courses are based in the PA state standards and skills. Our students look at theme and characterization and effective means of communication. And our instruction is really driven by the students in front of us and their personalized pathways. Around this time, we explored the body of research that suggested we could take a different approach to the structures we have in place. The research on the topic dates back to the 1990s and is confirmed by more recent studies that take into account our ever-changing world. We also explored past district-wide work to address leveling. In the 2015-2016 school year, a committee reviewed the academic leveling process in our secondary schools and found a need to positively attribute skills and growth-oriented expectations. Ultimately, the review of the recent literature led our team to more questions, questions that we intend to spend some time digging into and further exploring. Those questions are how do we ensure that our structures meet the needs of all learners? What are the academic levels and how are they currently used in the Westchester Area School District? What does the research tell us about leveling into different classes in middle school? And what are the research-based practices for teaching, reading, and writing? To address our first question, we thoroughly reviewed the research regarding academic leveling. In 1994, Hallahan conducted a study to examine if leveling students has an impact on student achievement. Callahan found that leveling did not have an impact on student achievement and suggested the removal of leveling. A lot has changed since 1994, and for that reason, it is important to look at more current research. The wide body of research in regard to leveling continues today. In 2008, Wing Yi Cheng, Lam, and Chang Yang Chen found in regard to leveling that high and low achievers were, were able to benefit when group processes were of a high quality. 
In a 2022 meta-analysis study conducted to examine modeling, Terran and Trevanti found that detracking reforms where post, where, which postpone tracking reduce the number of tracks or smooth out distinctions across tracks have the potential to reduce inequality in education-based opportunities based on social background without harming overall student achievement. Contained within your board packet, please find these citations as well as other studies that support these findings. In reviewing the research, we looked for recent, rigorous research that is peer-reviewed and focuses on quantifiable evidence of effect, meaning in this case, academic achievement. We want to know that these studies were reviewed by credible experts, and we want the outcome to be something we could quantify. We looked at two different types of studies. We looked at individual studies, which examined leveling in school districts, states, or countries. We also looked at meta-analysis studies, where the, where the existing research was reviewed and met with very stringent quality standards. We heard from our community the need to make sure that removing leveling would support all of our learners. The research is clear that removing leveling increases academic achievement overall, and that it increases academic achievement for students with lower ability, historically underrepresented students, and low income students. The studies show that removing leveling does not reduce and more often slightly increases academic achievement of high ability students. The earlier leveling begins, the stronger the negative impact can be on students. As we conducted our research, we also examined the structures of academic levels currently in place within the Westchester Area School District. In Language Arts 6, a writing and communications focused course our students are leveled into accelerated honors, honors, and grade level. In reading through time six, students are leveled into honors and grade level. Accelerated honors courses are designed to extend beyond grade level standards. Honors, honors courses are designed to promote collaborative, guided, and self-directed learning. And our grade level courses are designed to provide students with essential skills and content knowledge aligned with grade level standards. The middle school transition is a significant turning point in a student's educational journey. And as such, there's a body of research exploring social and academic impacts of leveling specifically on sixth grade students. In a 2020 study, Leggett and Curtis Cotes suggest systematic changes to the structure of curricular tracking be implemented. The study looked closely at the sixth grade year and the impact of tracking on student identity and sense of belonging. Results of this study demonstrate positive changes in student perception in regards to belonging and academic success when students are not placed in levels. As our consideration is specific to sixth grade English language arts and reading, this study was of particular interest. As a district, our mission is to ensure that students are achieving their personal best. To achieve this, we must also ensure that there is a strong sense of belonging for the students in our schools. We also have to look at the content-specific needs of language arts and reading classrooms. Post-pandemic, our English teachers engaged in professional development anchored in supporting student readers and writers through research-based strategies. This professional development has been broad-reaching. We attended the National Council of Teachers of English Conference. A variety of teachers have attended trainings through the Chester County Intermediate Unit and the Pennsylvania Writing and Literature Project. Our entire department has engaged in professional development with our consultant, Dr. William Lewis of the University of Delaware. Our learning through all of these different opportunities affirms what the research has shown us. Students learn best when other, with other kids when engaged in collaborative activities where they can derive meaning about complex material together. This work has been exciting and energizing for our teachers, but we also heard you. We know that we have more work to do. We not only want to explore our current model and unpack the research, the research-based educational practices, but to under, we understand that further consideration is necessary to make sure that we as an educational community are making the best decisions for all of our students. This spring, we will continue to research academic levels and the impacts on all of our students. We also want to hear more from our community. We will be engaging in conversation this spring with parent groups, such as the PTOs, the Padres Latinos, and the Gifted Pack. 
we will continue to engage in professional development with elementary and middle school teachers and administrators. This spring, we will convene an exploratory committee to continue this work. This summer, the committee will continue to examine the research and engage in conversations with districts that have removed leveling. We plan to return to the Education Committee in the fall with an update from our continued research and community conversations. The Westchester Area School District's mission statement says that we are working to help students achieve their personal best. As educators, we believe strongly and passionately in that mission. It is what drives our work in the classrooms every day, and it is what pushes us to explore and understand the research and to constantly improve. We look forward to working in partnership with our community to learn more and to better serve our students. I welcome the opportunity to answer any questions you might have. Thank you so much, Ms. Bailey. Um, I've had an opportunity to speak with you about this, but I'm gonna open it up to our other board members who may have questions or comments about the work that you've done. I wanna thank you for doing this work and also for the presentation that's so thorough and helps us understand the processes you've been going through and also how you're planning to adjust those processes given the feedback we've received from the community. Comments or questions? I have a question. Hi, thank you for the presentation. Um, I do see that part of the plan is to convene an exploratory committee to continue looking into it. Would you be including parents on that committee? Yes. How will you go about choosing that committee? In the past, we've reached out to our parent organizations and we've asked for feedback on who would want to be a part of that committee and that same process will be followed for this as well. Okay. And, and one group that you'll be reaching out to will be the gifted pack? Absolutely, yes. Their input. Okay. Thank you. So as a follow on to that, I mean, not all parents are engaged in those specific organizations, but I'm just wondering if there's an opportunity here. Um, especially, I'm thinking of especially the special education um, community because so many of those families are already underwater and they may not be in PTO, they may not be in those points of engagement and I want to make sure we don't miss an opportunity to have their voices represented and we find a way to really encourage them to be a part of this process because I think um, they don't always speak the loudest for a lot of reasons. Um, and sometimes it's hard in representing a child, and I, I have children like this, it's hard to share their struggles publicly. They're not gonna be the parents necessarily who come to the podium all the time, because that is hard to talk about in a public forum. So I wanna make sure those parents and those families and those students have adequate representation. Thank you. I think to that point, uh, Ms. Swansley, one of the points that is important to note as far as this layered approach, um, so in the beginning, Ms. Bailey had talked about making sure that we have an opportunity to connect with parents in groups such as that, but I think it's also important for us to have a layer approach to go where our, our families are to start at the schools, because we want to make sure through their, through each individual school community that there is an opportunity to hear from our families, to hear from our teachers and administrators, and then begin to funnel that to representative voices to serve on the committee. So I think that that's part of our, that's our starting place to recognize that we have people before us, we have folks that, that are carving out times, but we also have to make sure that we're meeting people where they are, and we know that that work starts at the school. So that's important for us to note, and I wanna make sure that that's not lost in, in what was presented. Thank you. Uh, I have one more question. Oh, sorry. I, I, oh, sorry. 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 I appreciate the presentation. I couldn't have clarified a lot of things, uh, a lot of questions that I had, and I, from the questions that came to us earlier, uh, the presentation may have begun to answer those questions as well. So I look forward to our thoughtful consideration of all aspects of, of leveling and um, and see, I'm, I'm, I'm really happy that we're doing something to work on this achievement gap. And if it works to close that, then you know, what do we have to lose? I, I, I really, I think we have to be aggressive in looking at methodologies to make sure that we work on that gap. And change is scary, change is scary, but we have to do something. And we have to, we just can't kind of sit back and just say, well, we hope it closes, because it's not, unless we do something. So thank you for your thoughtful presentation. I look forward to what it brings in the future. I just have kind of a practical question because it's hard for me to get my head around how this will work and I am 
coming from an experience of 20 years of having three high achieving students in the district. So I understand a lot of the comments and the concerns from uh, the parents for tonight. Would a sixth grade reading class that's not level resemble a fifth grade read reading class or a fifth grade classroom where there'd be reading groups and that students would be reading different texts or literature and then they'd be breaking up so I guess I don't, i just trying to get my head around how how that helps anybody other than the, the, the fluidity of students being able to move within the groups within the, in the classroom as they do in elementary school. And that is something that we're going to continue to work on throughout this process. Our teachers have engaged in a lot of professional development in terms of different choices for text, of how to bring that into the classroom, of those research-based strategies to support our readers and to really support our learners in the process. We had a ton of books were, that were approved, particularly for our sixth grade level earlier this year, and our teachers have been working with those books to incorporate those more into the curriculum and to build that piece as well. And that's continued work that we'll look at over the course of this process as well. Thank you. So this is more or less a pilot where it, it's more or less fluid in its, pro in its uh, process. I think where we are engaged right now is a place of exploration as far as the why we were starting here. But those guiding questions are just that, to make sure that we have an opportunity to convene as a group of representative stakeholders to explore what is the next step and to determine when's the appropriate time for that next step to take place. Thank you very much for the presentation. I've been doing my own research. I'm a former teacher. I have about 40 years in teaching. Um, elementary is my background. And um, I've taught fifth grade, I've taught sixth grade. And I think a big piece of this, this is just my opinion, is that trans transition piece that's very important with if we move toward this change. When, they're in, when the students are in fifth grade, they're the um, oldest. When they get to middle school, they are the youngest. And some of the research that I've read is they're into peers, they don't listen to their parents, they want to be an individual. Um, and the other thing I, I think is um, pretty important when we think about this. I'm not sure how I feel about the seventh and eighth grade transition with this, with non-leveling. But sixth grade, I would, I would tend to support it very much. Um, but can you tell me um, about the age developmental appropriateness? Because the age is very important through a transition like this, especially that sixth grade age. Do you have any research on that? Yes, I know the Leggett Kurtz COTA study, that one specifically looked at middle school. And there's others in the board packet that are underneath that question. So I'm trying to kind of break the research up by the question that we were looking at. Because to your point, sixth grade is that year of transition. It is the year where moving to the middle school is it's a change. And we want to support our students in that process. We want to support them as they're entering that adolescent piece to build that sense of belonging, to feel that sense of self within the school, and this would help do that. It's where the research seems to be leaning, but again, it's something we need to continue to consider. It's why it's one of our guiding questions, because that is a, it's an area to explore. And when I was listening to parent concerns, I, I understand that if you're not in education, but if you have children, um, I just think it's very important. One of the most important things, I think, with reading the language arts, um, children have to feel comfortable. And if they feel success, and if they feel driven, um, I just, I think it's a good idea for the, you know, for the, what we're doing. We're looking into this, um, very challenging. It may be scary to some parents um, when we think about it, but, um, I just think it's a pretty, having a lot of experience in this area, I think it's a pretty good move. I wish I had it when I taught sixth grade, so. So the follow-up to that, I mean, so I have a fifth grader, and like, I think about that transition next year, and, you know, the emotional aspects of it, of showing vulnerability to peers at a time that the stakes just seem to be increasing 
even more so now at the middle school level. And we heard a lot of really interesting comments from the community tonight. And there's a couple that I'd like to punctuate. Um, one, you know, around, you know, the social emotional stability of this age group and the potential for either an increase in behavioral issues or challenges with the existing ones that we're receiving. Um, I really like the comment about shrinking class sizes and increasing the lean and support. And I'm curious to know if that is a part of our plan. Are we able to do that to ensure the success of this program? When we hear from you in the fall, I really want to be able to see and understand how we're going to be, and we use that we're tracking here, but tracking the efficacy of these changes so that we really know if it works here. So the research comes across as a little bit of confirmation bias. You've heard that from the community tonight. And I just wanted to be really clear that like, we need to understand that there's always unintended consequences. It will not work for every student. We need to be able to understand how we will recapture those who fall out of this if it doesn't work for them, and that we don't leave any of the students behind, whether they are a GIEP, a regular IEP, a 504 student, or even just a middle of the road performer. Um, one of the other questions I just had, though, is when you talk about like speaking with teachers, I am curious, in terms of those who brought this forward, what is the level of representation? Like, how many staff do we have at the sixth grade level in ELA, in reading, and what percentage of them brought this forward as a concern, if you're able to speak to that? So I think you know, it was brought up by multiple different schools, multiple different you know teachers within those buildings, Conversations around this went even bigger than that. We were talking about this in September at a professional development and sort of came up and then they sought me out to talk to me later in November to speak to this. Um, so it's, I'm not sure the exact number of teachers offhand, but it was multiple buildings, multiple staff members, and it was ELA and reading teachers who came to kind of bring this idea forward based on their experiences in the classroom, just sort of a, what if we talked about this sort of frame to it? Okay, I want to thank all of the board members for their thoughtful comments and the community members again. And I think that one of the things that we're seeing here is that there are so many different questions and research can only get us so far. You know, there's been a really rigorous body of research on tracking for the last 30 years. And it's pretty clear that tracking, detracking can help improve academic achievement. But that the devil is in the details, first of all, and as Stacy just pointed out, that doesn't mean that just because research says that overall this might be true, it doesn't mean it's true for every student. And so the fact that we're going to be engaging in processes addressing many of the questions that frankly the research is not going to be able to answer for us. We're gonna have to look to our peers in other schools. We're gonna have to look maybe at schools that considered detracking and didn't detract, in addition to schools that did. We're gonna to have to get information from professionals because researchers are one step removed from that, right? They're looking at the 30,000 foot level. We need to be engaging with our community and our parents and our, our peers in other schools to explore and figure out what are the barriers to doing this well or what, are the, what might other strategies be? So thank you so much, appreciate it. And I apologize I didn't say this before, but um, I do appreciate, I know that this is now a, a regroup for us on this, and that a tremendous amount of time has been spent compiling the information you've shared here today. I know for a fact many of you work through the weekend on this, and I do appreciate that lean on this, because this has been a community unifying event. I mean, I, I don't think we've seen this many parents all come out kind of on the same page on something, and I realize that maybe it's hard to kind of come back around on something we thought we were going to go ahead on, but I, I love seeing this. I love seeing the community representation. I love seeing the administration respond to it and us as a board discussing it. So thank you for all of that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the next topic on our agenda is ESSER spending. And for people who don't know what ESSER spending is, these are federal relief dollars that all school districts in the country were provided to help address some of the major challenges that we encountered during COVID. And um, we asked Dr. Reynolds to talk to us tonight about how the district has used those dollars and um, to give us a sense of um, 
the evidence of effectiveness and how we use those dollars. Thank you, Dr. Shaw. So available to members of our community, we have two handouts, two one-pagers that outline one ways that ESSER dollars, which are our gifts, elementary and secondary emergency relief dollars, how they've been spent in the districts since their exception, and also how we continue to plan and move forward in using those funds. So that's our, our first one, one feature. And our second one outlines the impact of ESSER spending as far as um, increasing learning opportunities for our students in response to the pandemic. So with that, I'll begin. We want to make sure to just that point we're outlining ESSER um, funds that are spent, the impact on learning opportunities for our students, and also uh, begin to frame um, plan spending as we fully um, utilize our available ESSER funds. Just as a point of, of overview, we're going to the next one. You can just, yep, okay. So as, as a part of federal relief dollars, which we've outlined, elementary and secondary school emergency relief funds, that's what ESSER represents, were available to us. We've had a um, total funding of about $10 million, and we've spent or encumbered $6.6 .6 million. We have a little bit less than $4 million to go, so we want to outline how our funds have been spent, and we also want to share with you how we plan to spend those remaining funds. So we've bucketed our funds as far as four major areas. The first major area of funds that have been spent is around remote and cyber learning. So it may seem like a distant memory, maybe not so much, um, but when we initially began in COVID processes, we had to adjust to our structure to make sure that we had available technology available for licensing, online programming, and actually the equipment for our students to engage in virtual learning. That was at a cost of about $2.15 million. So that was about 32% of our funds that have been spent have been in support of remote and cyber learning. Next, our overall learning opportunities that we've, we've spent our funds on, about $2 million, was to make sure that we were able to increase our learning opportunities in two main ways one through tutoring and the other through summer programming. So we wanted to make sure that we were engaging students with learning opportunities, focus support on a consistent basis, but also with a focused opportunity for more enriched instruction during those summer months. And you can see some of the ways we've been able to do that as far as book clubs, we've been able to expand our learning opportunity for students at both the elementary and the secondary level. And not just in a way for students that are struggling, but for enrichment as well. Our third main area that we were able to focus our ESSER funds around were for safety and cleaning materials. And this is a part of how we were ensuring that our schools and our facilities were safe. So about $1.7 million, or about 26% of our funding spent has been around cleaning supplies, materials, furniture distribution, um, and to ensure that our routines are clear, particularly during the time of COVID. And our last priority area as far as our ESSER spending has been around student wellness and support. So we began this evening with Dr. Warner talking about our Counseling 339 plan. This is one of those areas that we've been integrated as far as focusing on the mental health needs of our students. So that was something that we targeted about 12% of our district resources to ensure that we have um, additional specialists and staff support professional learning to address our student needs as a result of everything experienced by the pandemic. You can see currently we, need, we have a team of 12 faculty members and we have um, those team members that are focused on mental health, three of which uh, their positions are directly funded as, as a result of increased ESSER dollars. Taking a look at the impact on learning opportunities, we wanted to make sure that you had an overall snapshot as far as the students that were able to benefit directly from um, the investment in learning, learning resources that we had available to them over the past two years. So you can see we've, we've offered research-based um, learning opportunities through, as we've talked about, our summer learning offerings, book clubs, and also tutoring in our schools. And the breakdown as far as, we looked at three main categories. One, student participation by ethnicity. 
We also looked at our students participating that have a disability. And we also looked at participation for students that were economically disadvantaged. I do want to note that we had majority of our students participating by ethnicity, about 72% of our Caucasian students, about 15% of uh, Asian students participated in our ESSER funding programs. And you can see smaller increments of about 45% for our students that are Hispanic, African American, as well as multiracial. If you take a look at the students that participated with disabilities, we had 83% of our students did not participate, but we, we had a small population of our students with disability take advantage of our summer programming as well as our tutoring, and likewise, likewise for our students that were economically disadvantaged. One of the points we wanted to raise is for us access. So it, it's not perfect, but I think one of the um, pieces if you take a look at the next slide, was what is the impact on learning opportunities for overall, but also for those students that were able to participate in either funded, um, summer funded activities with a specific emphasis on math. So if you take a look over to get the same math and we compare our performance as a district in 2019 to that of the state performance, you can see that our students before the pandemic were 61% were proficient or advanced, 39% were not proficient. In 2022, which was last year's results, we took a look at specifically at math, we had a decline, a slight decline, where 48% of our students were proficient, 52% were not proficient. When we compare that as a result of the pandemic and the learning needs experienced by that to the performance overall across the state, you can see the comparison before the pandemic in 2019 to after in 2022. And Westchester as a district, we fared better than that state average and that state comparison. When we compare ourselves against ourselves and taking a look at how does that performance rate for students that participated and attended our, our <coughs> ESSER program and specifically take a look at our summer opportunities, you can see that students that participated in our summer learning opportunities benefited by and large by the impact of those learning opportunities and that uh, result is evidenced by their performance on our PSSA. And that's indicated there as far as students that not, did not attend versus our students that were attended were about 10% percentage points higher in proficiency on PSSA for math. Overall, our summer learning responses, we had to balance um, what opportunities we were going to have for students. We had feedback as far as making sure that students were not inundated with technology, particularly for our summer opportunities. We wanted to make sure that we were able to focus on social awareness and connection. Also, we had an opportunity to review and, and expose students to areas of interest, points of engagement. And so when we Surveyed our families, one point of note, do you feel that your child's summer learning experience maintained academic skills? 99% of our families felt that this was a great use of time in supporting academic and enriching. And then we also have just an anecdotal report from one of our parents here. Moving forward, how we will continue to expend our funds as we um, close out the funds that are available to us. We have. <coughs> those three main areas that are outlined. One, as far as the safety and uh, cleaning materials, we'll continue to close that out, but we will focus on HVAC installation and restoration projects. So we'll move from deep or daily cleaning to how does this impact sustainable projects for, for overall safety. For our, our learning opportunities, we have remaining funds as far as continued support for tutoring, which is going on across all of our schools at both the elementary and secondary levels as well as it's our final year to support um, summer learning through ESSER related funds. For mental health supports, that will continue to um, be in place, particularly as we, we fund staff and make sure that we have professional, available, professional learning available in the form of training. And we also wanna make sure that we are closed out, we've completely um, used our, our funds that we needed to have during our remote and cyber learning, so there are no additional funds will be spent for, for that. And at this time, I'll take any questions that you may have. Any questions from the committee? I actually
Alicia had a question. Um, going back to the first slide labeled impact on learning opportunities. Um, the first graph, student participation by ethnicity. I just want to make sure I'm understanding the graph correctly. This is an overall snapshot of the students who participated. We're saying that 72% of the participants were Caucasian, 15% of the participants were Asian, correct? Yes. How does that compare to the overall district demographic? So we have a, a elevated participation for some groups and an underrepresented participation for, for others. Do we have a sense of which groups those are that are over, more represented versus underrepresented? For our underrepresented groups, I could, I could tell you would be for our Hispanic, our African American, our multiracial students. For our overrepresented or an, an increase would be our Asian population. And for our Caucasian students, it's a little less. I know you're taking committee questions right now, but I have something that's uh, a follow-up to that. The, um, that. That same page, the laugh for economically disadvantaged student participation, it's a, it, I look at that and you're, it looks like it's saying that only 8% of disadvantaged students participated. But I think maybe it's saying that 8% of the total were economically disadvantaged? Of the students mm -hmm. that we have? See, that's not good if only 8% of um, economically disadvantaged students participated. We do have that as, as an area of need as okay. far as particularly for our summer programs. Okay. That's why the tutoring benefits were very important to us during the school year because for summer we did have a lower rate of students that were economically disadvantaged participating. Okay. So what we do wanted to do to share where are the points of highlight and emphasis but also where are the points of need as far as why we have continued learning opportunities that are needed mm -hmm. as we um, close out spending because yes, we do have gaps as far as access. Okay, thank you. Another question. So. When we're talking about the summer learning, is this specifically the summer learning programs that were introduced around the COVID years, or would this have also included include extended school year? So we're just looking at um, the summer learning programs that were offered that are funded by ESSER. So for our, ESO, our ESY programs, they're, they're funded by IDEA funds for our students that are in, in special education. But for this, it's important to note that we looked at different opportunities because we wanted to make sure that transportation or access wasn't a barrier. So we also had um, preview learning opportunities available for all families. Um, we made sure that that was something that we communicated and we had as pointed in two places. One, that was shared with our all families weekly for their point of access, particularly for those at the upper elementary and middle school levels. Um, and we also were able to track as far as the point of access who was engaging in those points of preview learning opportunities, particularly for math and for reading and also in the area of science. Because just because some students were able to carve out different times during their summer schedule or not have transportation available to them, we didn't want that to be a barrier. So I have a question on the second set of slides, the impact on learning opportunities. Um, the first chart on the left, looking at the PSSA map. <clears throat> So while I appreciate that our overall numbers of proficient or advanced are still above state levels um, in 2022, I mean, it's a pretty significant drop, 13% uh, by our benchmarks, which um, again, you know, thinking about the conversation with reading is like looking at it, I mean, that's a pretty significant dip. Have we really looked at how to address that beyond just the summer augmentation? Because while it did show some improvement for those who participated, it only gave us about 2% improvement versus a loss of 13%. And that just still feels like a really big gap that we have to recover from. Thank you for that. And as a point of follow-up and sharing, particularly our effectiveness measures where our students were performing, we selected math because it was our greatest area of need. So we know that our students rebounded. Um, better in, in reading and writing. They did not rebound as, as well as in math. So particularly at the middle school level, we've been able to adjust the resources we have available for math intervention and make sure that there's a point increase, a 
point of access. That was something that we looked to adjust last year and that continued this year because that was a specific point of focus. The other point that we continue to know as far as SR2 during that continues for this year, what that looks like as far as students that are able to have access to that tutoring and to increase the frequency of that and to make sure that it's available in multiple modalities. Last year, tutoring was available for students to support, but we really focused on students that needed that support as a result of loss of COVID as far as students when social distancing and quarantining was a thing. This year, we, we focused tutoring support exclusively for students that have a learning need. Um, we looked at specifically math, reading, also we looked at students for executive functioning skills, for organization and study skills to make sure that we had that available, particularly for our students at the middle and high school level. So one of the things we wanted to do was to share that we have lots to celebrate as far as how we were able to be responsible in our, in our, in our spending, but we also wanted to say that we do continue to have areas of needs as far as the impact of the pandemic and not um, that in any way, but to say we can celebrate the work that has been done, outline where our work is moving forward, and also say that that is the area that we continue to monitor our measures um, to make sure that we're closing the gap. I appreciate the critical. I appreciate the critical look at um, where we are, where we need to be, and what we need to work on. I, I really do. Any other questions or comments? Next up, we have an equity update from Dr. Martin. Thank you, everyone. Good night, everyone. <laughs> Are you late? Don't say good night. <laughs> good afternoon. <laughs> My role tonight is just to give you an update from the equity audit that was conducted 2020. Um, this was an extensive and a thorough. Did you turn your mic on? Oh. There we go. Sorry. This, like I said, was a very extensive update. Um, took a lot of time and was a costly one. And we have heard you. You have been asking, what has become of that equity audit? And so taking on this role, um, I have looked into some of what we have done. And you will be pleasantly surprised. A lot has been done based on the recommendations. So I just wanted to start off first focusing on our mission statement. And the reason is our mission is our purpose. That's why we are here. So I want us to just center ourselves on that mission. Why we're here is to educate, inspire all our students to achieve their personal best. So if we keep that in mind, with the mission, which is our purpose, comes goals. Because we have to set goals to carry out the purpose. And in order to accomplish those goals, we have to have strategies. And so what I'm going to walk you through tonight is we're going to look, based on the agenda, take a look at our comprehensive plan. So the district has created a, a, a comprehensive plan in 2022, three-year plan, and that plan has five goals. For tonight, I'm going to be focusing on the first three. And the only reason I'm focusing on the first three um, is because most of the recommendations from the audit live in these three goals. And so, I want to start off, there was our first three goals, access to district programming, innovative teaching and learning, and student involvement. Now, I'm going to hit you with my priorities first. And here's the audit. These priorities came right out of the audit recommendations. So the question sometimes comes up, what does an equity director do? <laughs> and there are a number of things that an equity director does. But just to give you a little bit, this is just 
a tiny portion based on the recommendations from the audit, working with HR to increase hiring staff representatives of the Douglas CASD students. And I'm not going to read all of that to you. This information will be on the website. That's one of the things I'm working on, updated the district website to include a lot of information about the equity work. And in fact, um, creating a larger document where I am doing an um, executive summary where I show you all the recommendations and tie them to the strategic plan. So that's coming, and I'm looking, I set myself a deadline for about mid-March to have that out. Now, let's go to the goals. So goal one, access to district programming. And look at the corresponding audit recommendation that goes with, um, with this. Um, one is to provide more intensive professional development in areas of differentiated instruction and student engagement for all professional staff members with an increase in accountability through administration oversight. Some of the current actions to facilitate or support that recommendation, co-teaching at the middle school for English learner, reading support and content area teachers. Support to MTSS teams to set goals targeted interventions, and progress monitoring and follow through. And this, like I said, there are about three pages here just from my summation, actually um, four pages, just focusing on goal one. And again, you will have access, I don't want to spend the time reading all of these to you, but you will get a chance to see how many of these um, actions steps have been taken to address these goals. And also, as you look through these, take, take note of how interwoven the equity work is throughout um, all of this. You'll find that pupil service, your English language arts, I mean, this is not a one-man show, and that was also one of the recommendations, that equity is really embedded in our curriculum and in all aspects of what we do here in this district. Taking a look at goal two, innovative teaching and learning, and the audit developing an equity-focused theory of change and logic model and revisit the three-year comprehensive plan to include strategies and action steps that identify, assess, and address equitable outcomes for students. And here we are, this is what we are doing. And i mention a few here. Teachers emphasize the teaching of strategies and themes which allow student choice. That's a very big move that I know is taking place when I was in the building. Um, we don't teach books, we teach strategies. You can teach a theme and use any book and you can also reach a variety of students when you do that, because you can have a child reading at an accelerated level, and you're talking about a specific theme, and that child is reading at a level and can understand that. Whereas a child at a lower reading level can also understand the theme at his or her level. Um, cultural competency is also key, because with cultural competency, you're allowing kids to read things that interest them things that honor and their, 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 their culture and their way of life. And again, go to, we have a number of, you, you can see that, so not to, not to bore you, I'll allow you to read those on your own. Some of you probably have already looked them over prior to coming. And then I'll go to goal three, student involvement ensuring that K-12 curriculum reflects the cultures relevant to school districts, diverse population, and all students' understandings of equity and social justice. So some of what has been done, um, we have adding courses of student interest that focus on race and ethnicity, streamlining to align to diverse cultures, and we have integrated some non-Western instruments 
because children are in interested in, you know, in their music. And so that covers the three goals and the, the, the recommendation and the action steps that's been taken, that's just some of what have been take, um, have taken place. Moving on to future action. So I first show, shared my priorities. Those are like the things I really want to work on pretty quickly. But these are some future actions. So future actions will be happening, not immediately, but in a little while. Identifying improved pathways for understanding, fostering, and nurturing student voice in authentic ways. There's a big push um, as I um, take a lot of um, PD for myself with the Delaware Valley Consortium for, Edu for Equity and Excellence. There's a big push for student voice, and this is a very critical piece that I know I'll be, you know, addressing soon. And, and this is a build, going to be a building wide, not just me doing. Um, and establishing a principal advisory board at each secondary school. See how beautiful it is to hear from students? Student voices are powerful. They are right there in the classroom, and they know what's up. We can, we can talk to them and gain so much information. So th these are some critical areas, as you take a look, that um, will be addressed in the near future. Now that I know I'm here, I'm digging my heels in, and really want to see action. I know the community wants action, and I want action. All of us want action. This district is doing a tremendous amount of work. When I look and see all the things that are being accomplished, I am just overjoyed. I mean, this is like an excellent private school. But as Dr. Um, Reynolds says, there are still areas that we want to work on. And from an equity perspective, next steps. Work with DELT, that's the district, at, um, the district equity leadership team members, to develop metrics for measuring results. We want to see results and we need to have measurements. And in looking at the measurements, not only to see the results in their absolute terms, but recognizing where children starting from, looking where were they, how, and the same group of students, too, that's also important, and how have they progressed. And in multiple areas, we can look at formative assessments. Those are those quick assessments that you give, you teach a skill, you know, how did kids do on this? Look at um, also standardized tests. Look at some of those summative tests. But looking kind of broadly at how children are performing and measuring it so that we get a real clear picture of how they're doing. Provide data to support the impact of the recommendations that have been implemented. So all the things that we're doing, and I know that's going to be difficult, but we have people who can do that, can piece through, because there are a lot of things that are being implemented. So checking to see what's really working and what's not, and how do we readjust. And last but not least, this is one of the, the thing that gets me most excited, to launch a parent and community partnership of mentors and tutors. I'll tell you that this idea came to me probably about 10, 15 years ago as a teacher. And I look at this community that has tremendous amount of resources. And one of the big, biggest wealth we have is our human capital. We have brainiacs in this district. We have people who are retired. We have accountants. We have counselors, mental health um, providers. We have it all. And we have people who are willing and able to assist. I'm listening to Dr. Reynolds' report. And one of the things with all that we're doing with the um, ESSER funds, we still have limited access by some groups of children. So some of our children who are most needy, 
even with what we're doing as a district, they still can't access it. When I think of children, I think of a future. These little people are going to become an adult one day. We need to change the trajectory of their lives. The situation they were born in doesn't have to be a lifelong um, you know, mark on what they can do. And so in my vision, I picture what it would look like as we gather our community and community members, if you can hear me, um, we'll be reaching out to you by early April. We'll be calling on you. We're going to have a gathering. What this is going to look like, we don't yet know. Neither do I want to know, because I want it to come from a group of people who are putting our heads together for the sake of our children in our district, in our community. Who can give 15 minutes, half an hour, teach math for half an hour, three nights a week? Three nights a week? Who can read with a kindergartner and close that gap? Mom or dad doesn't have to leave the house and worry about transportation. I'm thinking in my head, Zoom. Others, or some kind of um, platform like that. But you know what? Parents, community members, you are going to come with the ideas. We are open. We're going to brainstorm. And we're going to blanket our kids with support starting September when schools start. Every child should have more than one person at a beck and call to help and assist that child. And there should be no excuses because you can, you can mom or dad can be making dinner because I want to make, those are some of the things we'll be working through to make sure we are protected and parents are home. You know, this is not a babysitting service. This is to mentor and to tutor, to build relationships. So this is one of the big plans um, that we are working on. I'm still meeting with a small um, committee that I've formed, and um, very soon we'll be sending this out. So please stay tuned, um, and I look forward to full participation from our community. Let's put what we have been saying into action. Thank you. Thank you so much. Any questions? Comments? Carol? We all greatly appreciate your enthusiasm and the depth of knowledge you have in this area. We thank you for what you're bringing. <clears throat> One of the questions I have, and it's probably an unfair question, but in a perfect scenario, uh, one, of your, one of your priorities that you listed was work with adult members to develop metrics for measuring results. Mm -hmm. When, in a perfect world, when would you have those, measure, those metrics? What would, what would the timeline look like? Right now, um, I, I think I shared this earlier, but um, all the buildings currently are working on an equity barrier that's impacting student performance. And in our last meeting two weeks ago, um, we had about four people from four different schools who shared. One was, a person shared about suspension rate in the elementary school. One shared something about relationship. One was attendance, and I forgot what the fourth one was. But they all had different things that are high priority um, in their, their respective buildings. And so we are doing the root cause analysis. So they are going to look for the root cause, asking those why questions, digging deeply to see why is a child absent? Rather than just speculating, oh, it's because mom is working and nobody's there to get the child ready. No, we don't know that. Let's ask the question and be certain that we know. Because until we know, we can't have the right solution or the correct solution. So the buildings are working on that. Some are at the stage now where they're collecting data. Others, I think, will be ready to implement by probably sometime in the fall. Others might not be ready until probably early in 2023-24 um, school year. Um, so 
a part of the strategy is to develop the metrics based on what, of course, the problem is, what they have identified, and the solution. So they ought to have data of knowing where are the children when they started doing this, and be able to measure how they're doing on like their test, formative and summative assessments, TSSAs, and then we'll be able to report to you when we have that data. But we want to keep everything transparent because if we're working, this is important. We need to know, is this working? And if it's not, then we have to change course. So depending on where this, each individual school is as far as determining a barrier, yes. if they're collecting uh, baseline data mm -hmm. that then can be used later to see are we making progress towards reducing attendance gaps or, or suspension rates. And then tying it back to how is this impacting academics? Because again, that's our purpose. That's why we're here. So everything has to go back to that. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Any other questions? No. Thank you so much, Dr. Martin. Thank you. And last but not least, always Dr. Mensa, patiently waiting. <laughs> No, it's better than a count. Well, it's, it's not a count. I don't know. It's just equally as interesting. It's very interesting. It's very interesting. <laughs> so thank you, Dr. Shaw. Tonight, I just want to take the board through a process that we went through for a uh, request for a proposal for our before and after school program. Uh, we had had a child's place for the last 12 years, and uh, we decided that it was time to go out for a bid. And over the last course of the last three months, we uh, went through an entire process with the committee. We started off. Uh, in November with uh, touring our elementary buildings with the bid companies. Um, since then, we've had presentations with the uh, bid committee, and on that committee were el elementary uh, principals, uh, folks from our business department, and our supervision department. Um, and then finally tonight, um, after we went through a rigorous scoring of the companies that put a bid in, I have a recommendation for you. But before that, I just want to take you through uh, and inform you of the four companies that went through the entire process. One company was um, a child's place, which we currently use. We call them ACP, another acronym. Another company was Alphabest. Uh, a third company was Champions, which you might have known as Kindercare. Uh, they were called Kindercare in our area. And then, of course, the YMCA. So those four companies went through the entire process with us. Um, as the committee scored the, uh, the four companies, we based them on uh, four different categories. The ability to meet financial obligations to the district was one category. Another category was their successful experience, not just in or about the Westchester Area School District, but elsewhere. The program content, and then finally was the program fees, meaning the tuition costs that were put forth to the families. So after we scored all four categories, we are going to recommend that a child's place be our before and after care provider for the next three year contract. Questions or comments? Yeah. Dr. What was the difference in the fees from what they are current state to now going forward for the next three years of the contract? You mean from the, the bid winner to the to the or no for the for the new bid then for a child's place, what is their fee structure now compared to current state? Um, John, do you know that? Karen, that? fee structure mean fee structure to the yeah. parents or fee structure to the district? So it's both, there's, I guess, I guess it's both, yeah. So the fee I structure to the parent, ACP actually came in the second lowest, but within probably a $5 variance um, for a weekly full-time student. Um, the rental fee reimbursement to the district was substantial. Um, I believe it was $85,000 or more in a rental structure guarantee than the next lowest. That answers my question. I'm, That's exactly right. I'm sorry, I don't have a microphone. I'm the community country. Yeah, the, and the other part, yeah, this is one of you reminded me what I, the part of my question was, I was asking what the difference is from our current contract today to the new contract for, for the next year. What's the delta difference? How much more was it? No change in tuition okay. for the parent fee. Yep. And our fee is $10,000 more a year, and then it graduates up each year based on what their current fee is. Okay. All right. Thank you for the clarification. What 
strengths from um, a child's place really stood out that kind of moved them to the front of the line? And were there other strengths from the other organizations that stood out? Sure, so a child's place, uh, we, we know them, so they're a known identity. Um, we also know that um, they have um, somewhat of a structure uh, for our after school program. Um, you know, to keep in mind, our before and after school program, it's really a revolving door. So to really say that we're going to be sitting down to a science activity at 415, you don't know how many kids are involved in that after or before care. Um, so we know what they have to offer. Uh, other, another company, uh, Champions, which is, as I said, is kindergarten in our area, um, they have a, a very structured day for our students. Um, another company, Alphabet, the same. So they all offer some type of guidance while they are in before or after care. It's just, you know, it's, it's also the staffing that we also took into account because the staffing for those types of programs is very hard to staff. Um, because of the time period. So we also asked some of our paraprofessionals to be a part of that staffing part. So we knew that a child's place could, um, can guarantee you some of our staffing. Okay, thank you. Welcome. Any other questions? If not, we have to vote. Yes, Dr. Shaw. So the vote is to approve to, to bring forth to the full board on the 27th to vote for a child's place for, for a before and after care provider. Okay. I know it's late, but could I just ask about the why? Not much, much. They seem to have a lot of um, variable programming for. So I'm, I'll, I'll let John talk about the the, um, the the finances of the why because I, I believe John. Um, they you just say it was out of line. It was out of line. Thank you. <laughs> Are you ready to vote? Yeah. What would your vote be? Yes, Grace. Okay. Yes for me. Yes. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Chung. Yes. And with that, our education committee is adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.